put it through a screen. Make sure that we got all the artifacts out of that spot. Then once we had excavated it, we actually went over it again with a metal detector to make sure that we had gotten whatever artifact was in there that was lighting it up. And sometimes what happened was we would excavate one artifact, we'd go in there and then whoop, 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 and there would be another one in there. So we would excavate a little bit more and find another one. So we did this for about uh, two and a half days. So our goals. We have to convince SHPO that there's an actual site here of Pike's Cantonment. They're not going to do anything to put this site on the National Register until we come up with concrete proof that this is Pike's Cantonment. What we have to this point doesn't say a thing. All it says is there's a historic component here of some sort. Could have been nothing more than a barn for all we knew. So we have to find evidence of military activity. And second, we have to find evidence that the site is still intact. It's not enough that you just find the artifacts. You have to find a site that still has some integrity to it, some, some research value. Because if it's just a scatter of artifacts and no research value, it's not eligible for National Register listing. So, we found more nails. We found lots and lots of nails. And for the first day and a half, that's all we found was nails. And so the crew was getting kind of discouraged. We found yet another nail. But it turns out these nails are kind of significant because they, they, they happen to be nails that were manufactured during that time period of the War of 1812. And they were manufactured during a very narrow time period during the War of 1812. Now, granted, they were manufactured before the war, after the war, they could have been dated to any time around there, but they at least were something. But then, they came up with a thimble. An iron thimble. Well, we knew soldiers carried thimbles in their haversacks because every once in a while they had to sew a button back on or fix a rip in their, in their trousers. But it still was not proof of military activity. Then we found this. When the crew found it, I was on the other side of the site doing something. They said, come on over here, we've got something. Looks like a pawn from a chess set. I said, well, that wouldn't be out here. Why would that be out here? Why would it be something made of metal? When I first took a look at it, I said, I think I know what this is. But let me check. And I went to another crew member on the site who was also a reenactor. And I said, this is what I think it is. He said, what do you think it is? I said, I think it's the base of a, of a, of a scabbard. He says, that's exactly what it is. This is the base of a bayonet scabbard. It's a piece called a chape. And it's made of metal, usually brass. It can also be made of iron. But it's the base of your bayonet scabbard so that when you shove your bayonet down into your scabbard, it doesn't slip out, slice through the leather, and cut your leg. It's on the site, and it's definitely military. But one piece is not going to convince Shippo. We've got to find more. A little while later, we came up with a musket ball. It turns out to be a musket ball of 69 caliber. We know that 69 caliber was the caliber of musket used by the American Army during the War of 1812. 1795 Springfield musket. So this was a good thing. And something else we could tell about this musket ball was that it was dropped. It wasn't fired, it was dropped, because it's not deformed. If it was fired, it would have been deformed, it would have been egg-shaped. And if it would have hit anything, it would be compacted. None of that occurred. So from this, we know that this musket ball was dropped. But everybody uses muskets. Even farmers use muskets, and they could have gotten a musket for them in, during their time in the uh, militia and used it to go hunting. Still was not 
definite proof. But then, we found the exclamation point. We found not one, but two regimental infantry coat buttons. And if you look right down at the bottom, I don't know if you can read that, but they are stamped 15 for the 15th Regiment, which we know was Pike's Regiment. We now have concrete proof that this is the site of Cantonment Saranac. Okay. Yes? What's the J stand for? It's not a J, it's a script I for infantry. Something else we know about these buttons that make them very significant. Not only are they stamped 15 for the 15th Regiment, but we know that these 15 buttons, along with buttons that were stamped 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, were only stamped for the original 13 regiments, or 15 regiments of the Army at that time. Or 16, 17, there were, there were something like 15 or 16 regiments at the time. And those buttons were only stamped for those initial regiments. Each new regiment got buttons that just had a star in the cartouche. These buttons were only made for the first year of the war. After that, they said, we're going to simplify this thing and give everybody star buttons. So we know that these buttons were made during the first year of the war, which is even more concrete proof. So. Now our second goal. We have to find evidence that the site is intact. In order to do that, we began what I hope to be a enduring, occurring field project where we cleared off one of the areas where we think this stone structure here is a foundation for a brick fireplace cleared one of those off and we began to do some controlled excavation near them to see if we could find some evidence of activity around these things. Because that's, that's what would really tell us that these sites are intact, that there's activity going on around these fireplaces and inside these cabins, is that we would find um, evidence of activity. I mean, because soldiers do things in camp. They have to cook, they have to eat. And all these domestic type things, so we should be able to find evidence of that inside these huts. This is the crew we had. Uh, they're actually volunteers that, uh, um, that, that did this through uh, uh, paying a fee to the Battle of Plattsburgh Association. It was a fee that basically paid for, partially paid for the, uh, the research that was conducted here. <clears throat> and they were they were a super crew. They worked all week. They <laughs> were very discouraged by the second day, but they plotted on. Uh, and in the middle of the week, when we found uh, the, the the buttons and the tape, everything everything changed. Uh, but they were super good. This is one of the units that we worked in. It's right next to a corner of this foundation. And what you see here, this is the original Pleistocene soil. This is undisturbed. What you see here is an area that is disturbed. You see it's darker in color, and it also is just covered in brick. When we excavated it out, it turned out to be very, fairly deep, much deeper than the area surrounding it, and very straight. I think this may be a wall of one of the cabins. Because down at the bottom of it is charcoal. What happened to the cabins on the 31st of July in 1813? They were burned down. <coughs> this is the other unit we worked in. And this unit was unique. You can't really see it in this slide. But it was unique because when we got down about 20 centimeters, we uncovered what appeared to be a brick pavement, or not a brick pavement, a, uh, a stone, cobblestone pavement um, that may have been the actual floor of the cabin. Right? We think what they did is they covered the bottom of the cabin with cobbles and then laid planks over top of that. So 
now we have our proof. This is the site of Pike's Contonement. Oh, what questions we can now ask. How was Contonement Cernak organized? We know that there was a plan for the organization of, of, of contonements during this time period. It was von Steuben's plan. But we also know that virtually no one followed that plan. So it would be interesting to see if we can come up with a plan. We haven't done that yet. That's something we can look at for the future. Hut construction. How were the huts constructed? Were they log huts or were they plank huts? <clears throat> what were their size? What were their configuration? How many men slept in them? We have documentary records of how big they should be, according to regulation, but again, virtually no one followed those regulations. What interests me most, being an anthropologist, is military culture. Who lived in the huts that we, pres that we have preserved out there? Were they officers? Or were they enlisted grunts? And how did they, how was their existence different from the officers' existence? Because we have all kinds of documentation about how the officers lived because they wrote it all down in their correspondences. Yeah, I'm living in so-and-so's house and enjoying tea every day and life is grand. We have very little documentation about what it was for the common soldier living in these huts. So as an archaeologist, I'm very interested in documenting information that does not exist anywhere else. You can think of it this way. The people that get their names into history books are usually the wealthy and the powerful. Because they're the ones that can pay to have the history books written. It's the people that do all the work at the bottom bottom stratum of, of society, the ones that join the army, the ones that do all of the, the work, the servant work for the, for the upper echelons. They do all the work, but they don't get any credit for it because they don't end up in the history books. They don't get any credit for it. They don't get in history books. There's no history written about them. Archaeology is a way we can get a history of these people because we can actually find the physical evidence that they leave behind. And finally, we can actually start to tie, hopefully, archaeology and history together. We know from history some of the events that occurred there, like the burning. But we also know that the von Steuben uh, rule book prescribes that the camp be clean every day, meaning they pick up every piece of garbage and they get it out of the hut. Well, if they did that, then we're not going to find much inside those huts, are we? That would be an explanation for why we're not finding very much. Scavenging. Well, we know that the site, after the, after the uh, British burned it down, the site was scavenged by the local population for anything they could get out of it that was of value. Most importantly, nails. Nails were expensive back then because they had to be trucked clear from Albany unless you wanted to pay a blacksmith to make them one by one. So they were expensive. And local people scavenged them after the, after the huts were burned down, along with anything else that they could find that they thought might be of value. And finally, we know in July of 1813, the huts were burned down. We should be able to find evidence of that. And indeed, we did. So, what does the future hold? Well. As a result of the work that we did this summer, I am now working on a report that will go to the New York State SHPO office, hopefully by the end of the winter. Uh, and that will convince them that the site is authentic and the site is uh, eligible for a listing on the National Register of Historic Places. And hopefully in the spring of 2012, we'll begin that National Register nomination process First, it has to go to the state historic register and then on to the national historic register. It's a process that takes about a year. In the meantime, we are in discussions with Clinton Community College 
to undertake some large-scale excavations aimed at uncovering at least one of the huts completely. We want to define and uncover one whole hut to see how it's constructed, what kinds of artifacts we will find on the floors, and whatever other data we can get out of that. Those excavations will go on until Clinton Community College doesn't want to do it anymore, basically. Um, they're going to be field school, which means we're going to actually bring students in that are studying archaeology and teach them field techniques in the process. We are also going to open it up to the community through different avenues, um, one being through Battle of Plattsburgh Association here, the other being through the Teacher Resource Center here um, in, uh, in, in the county. In the winter time, we will likely schedule several laboratory sessions where we'll actually process the artifacts that we're finding. Every day that we spend out in the field, we spend about two days in a laboratory cleaning, cataloging, and then finally curating everything that we find. And everything that we find is coming back to the Battle of Plattsburgh Association. We hope that this will go on multiple seasons, and in the end, we will have at least one entire cabin completely excavated, which will give us a ton of data, which frankly, I've been searching now for, uh, ever since we confirmed that this was the site, I've been searching for analogs to the site. Where else in the United States have they excavated a cantonment of the War of 1812? I can find zero, none. They don't exist. The sites just don't exist. So this will be the only War of 1812 cantonment site that we have any concrete data for, if we can get it out of the ground. In closing, <clears throat> the, uh, the phase one and phase two research that was done on the site to begin with was funded by the US Air Force as part of their requirements under section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. The research that we did this past summer was underwritten solely by the Battle of Plattsburgh Association through um, the, the donations of their members, their memberships, as well as um, sponsors that they went out and they secured. So I want to thank them for giving me this opportunity and uh, also giving me a little bit to, uh, to underwrite my expenses for driving all the way here from Watertown. And also um, I was able to actually employ someone to help me that was an expert at metal detecting and probably we would not have gotten the evidence we needed without him. Um, the site itself is owned by the town of Plattsburgh, so it is publicly owned, um, and it is actually under the administration of the Federal Aviation Administration, so as long as we can keep the site protected as far as location, um, it stands a good chance of being preserved um, so that we can get the data that we, that we so long for. Um, it's very important that this site gets preserved because, as I said, it's the only one that I know of, and if the word gets out where this site is and the hobby metal detectors get to it and they pull up all the artifacts that they can find and there's going to be nothing left for us to find. And we're going to be right back to square one. So it's very important that this site be preserved. With that, I thank you. I think we actually have time to go catch the uh, kickoff. <laughs> <laughs> Because these stone features that we think represent uh, the, uh, the foundations of the chimneys are distributed throughout this entire area. Mm -hmm. And in this little area, there is no evidence of any bulldozer pushing that occurred. Now, right next to it, we do have evidence because there are piles that have Constantina wire and brick and, and concrete block and all kinds of stuff pushed into them. So. They came darn close to wiping this site off the map. Darn close. Mm. Over here first. 
Yeah, I think you were talking about the Van Steuben plan. Now, did that plan involve huts being so many feet apart? Paces. Paces, paces apart. Paces. And, I, you know, I've been to Valley Forge, and those cabins go up along a ridge line. Right. And those and, actually And actually, this is a ridge line from those, the river. Those actually predate Von Steuben, though. They do? Yes. Yes. Valley Forge was occupied when Von Steuben was first introduced to the Army, so he had not written his plan yet. He hadn't written his plan. Yeah. But by the time they ended the war, um, at a place called, uh, help me out, New Windsor, yes. The New Windsor Cantonment was laid out on the Von Steuben plan. Did it, did it, does that include, like, they had a place for uh, disposal of the garbage? Yes. Yeah. 300 paces behind, they had disposal of the garbage in the latrines. Uh, so many paces, then they had the officers' quarters, then so many paces the kitchens, so many paces the um, staff officers, and then so many paces the, the company streets. Did, do you have any indication at all that they maybe roughly followed that plan at all from what you have well, covered so far? As I said, this is the only <laughs> this is the only site that we have of this time period and uh, we've only just begun as far as the excavation. So at this point I have to say no, we have no indication of how the site is laid out other than the, the locations of these of these uh, foundations where they exist. Um, that's something that we hope to get in the future. And it would be interesting to see if they followed it, because um, from all indications of, of officer correspondences with their with their senior uh, with their senior officers, they didn't follow the plans. And certainly by by the Civil War, nobody followed it. I mean, they had new plans written up in 1862 that were based on the von Steuben plan, and nobody followed them. One other question: I was. I'm old enough to remember when Route 22 went right through you know, where the air base runway is. And I remember when they moved Route 22 where it goes through the cantonment. And uh, back at that time, uh, I don't, the state obviously didn't do anything. And did the Air Force have any historical where they had to do anything? There was nothing. Uh, you know, 19, nothing until 1992. Nothing until 1992. Yeah. Uh, I remember there was a gravel pit there somewhat yeah. uh, along. There the were all sorts of things that, I mean, they used that area basically to push everything they didn't want. Right. Uh, there, were, there were pistol and rifle ranges up there and uh, just basic, I mean, when they built the runway, they pushed everything up there to fill it in. You know, he was talking, uh, the other gentleman was talking about being a pristine site. Now, I'm old enough to remember when they built the road around there, that those woods were there then. They were there then, and they haven't been cut down or anything. So those woods have been there for a, a long time, and haven't been, nothing's been done to them. Well, this this was a very very large site. There were 2,000 soldiers there on the hillside. The hillside extended all the way down to the river. Right. So about a 45 degree angle. Of course, everything on the north side of the Route 22 has been destroyed, probably. Completely destroyed. Yeah. Over the past hundred years, it's been used twice as a dump site. The, the roadway was moved, the railway was moved, there was a railway spur back there in the 1800s. There There's was a dam. The Friedenberg factory, which was down by the by the uh, uh, falls at the top. Uh, this area on that side is, has been so disturbed that it's, it's rendered useless. Right. But we are lucky that this property has been at least somewhat protected over the past uh, military history of the base. It was termed worthless way back when. And the danger now is that we have the technology to change anything. At the time, in the early part of the 1900s, the latter part of the 1800s, uh, it was deemed worthless because you couldn't do anything. It's all rock, it's all stone, it's all big trees. They didn't have the technology or the wherewithal to change it. But now, there is virtually nothing on this earth that man cannot change. And that is the danger of what we have here. And as Tim says, this community is sitting on a national treasure. And that's the objective here. So spread the word. We need to protect the asset that we have on the new here. Uh, and this is our time. This is the zenith in our history. Uh, and that's where we have to go with it. 
we found some evidence of these 15 fragments. Were we able to recover any artifacts from the other two regiments? Essentially, essentially, we did not. But okay, it, but it all depends on where they all were. I mean, because I was, I would imagine they would be spread out in regimental camps yeah. Yeah. across the entire site. So our little section we have left may have just been where the 15th was. Exactly. And we will not find anyone else unless they sort of wandered into camp one day and popped a few buttons. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and one more question on the Van Steuben plan. Yep. Looking in the Van Steuben blue book, if that's the source for the Van Steuben yes. plan, the diagram that I'm seeing in the Van Steuben book looks to be a diagram for a, if you will, temporary ad hoc camp. That is, you move your wagons in here, you right. set your tents here as opposed to if you're going to be here for a while, consider building it like this. Is there another Van Steuben plan other than that regimental dr no. drawing? Okay. But and the, the reason why many people, the reason why the Army virtually ignored it was because it virtually fit no terrain yeah. that, that was available. Yeah. I mean, you had to have a broad open plain in order to, in, in order to do that. And nowhere really just, you could, you could fit that plan in. So they, so, they, so they modified it to suit. Windsor, Buckingham, New Jersey, Morristown, New Jersey. Those are the sites that we have as models. The closest is the Windsor. Yeah. I did find evidence that they excavated some War of 1812 period huts down in Alabama. That's the closest thing I can find. Yeah. What was the original size of the, uh, of the, of the site? And then what is usable now no that you can idea. actually you we can have actually, no uh, idea um, I, I estimate that the site was probably at one time probably on the order of 20 to 25 acres we had to, to oh, where, where, it, where it runs from the river up where that site is that's probably almost a half mile yeah. you know from from the river up onto that ridge and into that wood area there but uh, where you're dealing with what uh, six thousand men there or two thousand two so two thousand men and they're probably sleeping at least six to a hut, if not more. So you've got a, you've got a considerable number of huts to begin yeah. with. Yeah. And uh, Army regulation would have dictated they would have been spaced at, uh, I think the interval is two spaces, three, 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 three paces, two paces, something like that, between each hut. And what, what, a pace uh, is what, three feet? Well, actually, it's Whoever did the pacing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, look at the man back then, the average size man, what about five eight, five seven, yeah. five nine? You know? Well, uh, I mean, I mean, the, well, three I, I, I don't pace. know enough about that time period to know what the standard military pace was. All right. I'm sure one existed, but uh, yeah. you're an archaeologist. Not yes. A historian, right? Leave that for the historians. <laughs> we do yeah. have some indication anecdotally that, that this particular site, at least in one you know, these correspondence to different 10 men to a group in this one company uh, that we have a record of this one. Any other questions? Uh, you, yeah. know, you, were, you were worried about amateurs coming in and raiding the site with their... Uh, now, New York State has rather stiff fines for doing anything like that. And if it's on New York State property. If, well, uh, you root any artifacts that are removed, regardless of whether it's New York State property or not. Uh, Actually, I mean, no. this uh, we have experience with that when these young lads had the French cannons and were taken off uh, so that's a different Cliff story. Haven. That's and a different story because anything underneath the lake is considered New York State property. It is. Yes. So they, you couldn't post signs there warning them to the stiff penalties if anybody does. Well, you could. You'd be lying through your teeth, but you could. If, if they didn't know the law, they might listen to you. <laughs> so you mean you can go out with a metal detector as long as it's not New York State property? As long as you would have permission from the property owner. And you can pick up anything. As long as it's not New York State property. I didn't know that. We're in the process. The, the overlying jurisdiction is actually the county of Clinton. It happens to be in the town of Plattsburgh, so it's county property, actually. Oh, is it? Yes. Yeah. All right.
uh, local county laws if they actually have to be invoked. Um, right now, the answer is it's airport property and you are trespassing. You will be arrested if you're on the property without proper permissions. Um, we have to protect what we have. It is the only 1812 site of its kind in the country. So are any signs up there now? I haven't seen any. Well, we have not posted signs, signs because a private signs property sign. Sure. A, a new private property sign showed up. Yes. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, those show up everywhere. But if you posted a sign that said, keep out, don't go in here. Yeah. 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 Do not enter. <laughs> that would be like a beacon. We don't want that. Matter of fact, um, the sign that's up right now, which is uh, the, the historical marker, is just right. fine because They'll all be metal detecting over across the metal, the railroad tracks, and they can do that all they want. <coughs> well, again, thank you thank for coming, you. and uh, we have a special treat for you. I actually came in this afternoon, and uh, because I didn't have any really good pictures of the artifacts, I scrubbed them up, and uh, I actually found a uh, an empty case, and I have put them in, so we now have them on display in a case and we're going to bring them out and you can actually see the artifacts that we excavated. Mm -hmm. I would just set it right down the table. And yep, you absolutely. <laughs> did you count them before you set them out? Yes, yeah. I did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wasn't very excited. Thanks, Thanks for it. Dr. Tim Abel, how are you? Good. How are you? Uh, wonderful presentation tonight. Thank you. A couple of questions. Yes. How did you first learn about Pike's Contonement? Well, I actually learned about Pike's Contonement through Keith Herculo. Of course. Uh, he, uh, He's got a loud me. voice that goes all the way to Watertown. He cornered me at a, uh, at a symposium on the War of 1812 in Ogdensburg after I had given a talk about archaeological work I had done on several sites at Sackett's Harbor. And he asked me if I would be interested in doing some work on a site in Plattsburgh, um, which I said, yeah, possibly, maybe. Um, but I've, being an archaeologist, I get these all the time where somebody says, oh, come dig on my land. Uh, we got all kinds of stuff there, and uh, you sort of take all of them with grains of salt. Um, but the more I researched it, the more I thought that the possibilities were there, um, even though I was still skeptical right up until we found the first uh, concrete evidence. Um, but uh, that's, that's the way it all, all sort of came down. So give me a little bit about your background, Jim. Well, my background, I was uh, born in Fremont, Ohio and um, was raised there as well. Went to undergraduate school at the University of Toledo for a uh, degree in anthropology. Stayed there for my master's degree and then after I got my master's degree was looking for work and found a job up at uh, Fort Drum doing archaeology. So I took that job, went to Fort Drum um, in 1994 and while I was there I decided that uh, I kind of liked the area. The area had not been really touched as far as archaeology goes, and I thought it was a great opportunity for a dissertation topic. So I stayed in the area to do my dissertation work, and in the meantime met my wife, we had kids, we settled down, and that's sort of the story that, uh, that brings me to Watertown. And as I said, what brought me to Plattsburgh was, was the, uh, the talk with Keith Herculo over several, several seasons and several beers. Um, about all of those things are yeah. very important, but you know what? It's a, it's almost a serendipity that brings us together with things like this, isn't it? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, I mean the uh, the way things fall together sometimes is just uh, uncanny. Um, I have been doing uh, well, the, the way I came into doing a lot of the work that I did in Sackets Harbor was virtually the same thing that uh, you know we did a little historic research sort of cornered somebody and started talking to them and lo and behold next thing you know we're actually doing digs and finding stuff so it's 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 fun to do I uh, in my professional career I'm, I'm a uh, uh, professor at two community colleges um, both JCC in Watertown and also at uh, SUNY Canton um, those are both part-time gigs and um, uh, what I do to make 
the bulk of my living is that I'm a consulting archaeologist. And one of the things that you learn very quickly in consulting archaeology is that your clients would just assume you found nothing. And when you do, they certainly are not interested. Um, so getting a project like this where you have people that are not just interested but flat out enthusiastic is just, is just a fun thing to do. Even if we had not found anything, it would still would have been fun. It's, it's uh, <coughs> great to see passion. Yeah, when it, it comes is, to history, and we've been trying to instill that in a, for many, many years, and Keith Herkler is, a, is our fearless leader here. <laughs> and uh, as, as you and I said before the camera went on, but our viewers are, are, are very much aware of the fact that uh, Pike's Cantonment just became lost. Right up until over the years, right up yeah. until the end of a, a, a recent century, everybody knew where Pike's Cantonment was. A lot of people wrote about it, and then yeah. all of a sudden it just became obscure and lost, and the subject of uh, great mystery. Mm -hmm. People have found things. Well, I mean, you had documentary evidence uh, surfacing here, there, around. Yeah. None of it really concrete, but uh, it fueled a lot of speculation for over a century. And uh, until Keith found some concrete evidence that put a site in a location, we really did not know where Pike's Cantonment was. You know, we're, we're distressed that out of, uh, what, 20-some acres, you, you guessed that we only had two or two and a half left. But we're lucky we it's got the two and a half. Yeah. A two and a half might still give us quite a bit of data. I mean, certainly more than we have before, because there are no other sites of that quality um, that exist in North America that I can find. Uh, the War of 1812, specifically the battle surrounding this uh, lake battle on Lake Champlain, very important part of American history. And sadly, um, another September 11th has uh, eclipsed uh, our enthusiasm for studying this, even though we're, we're fast approaching the bicentennial of, the, of this mm -hmm. commemoration of the Battle of Plattsburgh. But there is a core of people including Keith Herculo and many others, mm -hmm. who are bent on enhancing the history, making it exciting for local people, but we've got to, we've got to holler a little louder so the world finds us, Tim. Yeah. It's, it's a travesty that while most of the War of 1812 took place right up here in northern New York, that northern New York always gets short shrift um, when it comes to research, when it comes to documentation, and even when it comes to the, the uh, celebration that's coming during the bicentennial. Most of the money is going to go to Baltimore, to Washington, D.C., and to New Orleans, unfortunately. It's uh, nice to tour in New Orleans and have them mention the Battle of Plattsburgh, though, and they do, <laughs> and their tour is down there. Yeah. Yeah. which is sometimes more than we do about them. Uh, Sackets Harbor, uh, my wife and I and, and family have visited Sackets Harbor for many years, and it's, uh, it pleases us to see what's happened there over the last 10 years. Yeah, um, Sackets Harbor over the last 10 years has really grown. Um, I'm actually president of the uh, Sackets Harbor Battlefield Alliance. Which I'm is glad I asked. That's the, great. Uh, the friends group that uh, is, is helping to preserve that battlefield. Um, and uh, we've worked really hard to, to bring the, the story of Sackets Harbor back into uh, the public's knowledge um, because it really was uh, an important site, not just for one battle. I mean, everybody uh, that knows a little bit about the War of 1812 knows about the Battle of Sackets Harbor, but most of them don't know that uh, it was the headquarters of the U.S. Navy on the Great Lakes throughout the entire war and that uh, it was probably the most heavily defended place in the Northeast during the War of 1812, and its shipyard built and launched more warships than any other naval shipyard in the United States. Well, we're on the map, and we're going to try to make that dot a little bit bigger on the map. You started your presentation tonight long before I started my camera here, and I apologize for that. But you talked, you know, a lot of people in our country have heard the name Zebulon Pike. Mm -hmm. They know about Pike's Peak, right? but they didn't know he had a cantonment here. And so yeah. it's important to give a little history about sure. the man. Sure. Well, Zebulon Pike was born in 1779. He was the son of Zebulon Pike Sr., who was an officer during the Revolutionary War. Um, he went in the Army very young in life and was actually appointed by uh, uh, General John Wilkinson during uh, the, uh, in 1806 to lead an expedition up the Red River to document uh, the, the source of the Mississippi River. 
and uh, this is the expedition that he found Pike's Peak, found and named Pike's Peak. Um, Ended that uh, excursion in 1807, came back to civilization, and uh, spent uh, the years between 1808 and 1812 being the uh, quartermaster general of the army, as well as several other mundane tasks that were sort of unbecoming of a, of a, of a desiring officer. Um, but when the War of 1812 broke out, he got his chance, was commissioned a colonel, and given command of the 15th Regiment U.S. Infantry. Um, and his first assignment was to march the infantry north to Plattsburgh, where he uh, would, took part in a raid on uh, a little known place called La Call Mill, um, which was an armed sort of strong point on the border between Britain and Canada at the time. Um, the raid ended up a complete miserable disaster. Uh, General Dearborn offered to resign several times after it uh, was a complete blunder. Um, it wasn't Pike's fault at all, uh, it was actually Dearborn's fault, but uh, um, the army marched back to Plattsburgh in shame and was ordered into winter quarters at Plattsburgh um, in that November of 1812. You know, I think in the very short time you've been here, you've made significant progress. And I, I hope you never underplay it because you, you uh, opened a door literally and figuratively into the past which people around here have been desperately searching for for years. Well, you know, it's not too many people that can say that uh, they get paid doing their boyhood hobby. Don't you love it? And uh, I've been really fortunate through the years to uh, have gotten the opportunity to make um, what really, uh, I mean, archaeology is really what, what lights me up as far as interests go. And I was very lucky, very privileged to, uh, to be able to make it a career. And I'm just glad that uh, I've, I've been able to do this because, uh, you know, these opportunities, as I said, don't come along very often. But you'll be coming back. I certainly hope so. Well, you're as long work, as you'll have. You're going to work more this fall? Uh, not this fall, no. Uh, what we're doing this fall is we're washing up what we found this year, and we're going to write up that report so that we can get the National Register nomination process started. Well, that's critical. Yes. Actually critical. Yes. Get this noted as a genuine historic site. Well, it also opens up grand opportunities as well. So. Wow. I'm, I'm sorry to tie you up long after kickoff will be very, very soon. Thanks so much, <laughs> yeah, Doctor. You're welcome. Great to see you. Yeah. Keith Herkelo, I, I can see the excitement in your eyes, and you can sense my excitement, even though I was here 15 minutes late because I forgot that it was at 7 instead of 7.30, but... You, you, uh, you heard the part where it's the only one in the nation. That's what uh, you I need to I talked to the good doctor afterwards. What a decent guy. Absolutely. Uh, you and I have used the word serendipity at least 4,000 times in our interviews over the years, but it was serendipitous that you and he happened to be in the same place at the same time, wasn't you, it? There is, there is no other word to describe it, and uh, and as I said when, when, we, when we started the park, you, you came in a little bit after, that uh, as soon as he opened his mouth and started to talk, I knew that he was the person we needed. So when he was finished speaking, uh, of course I... I moved closer and closer and closer and then plied him with a beer and uh, we sat yeah, he told me that too. Did he really? I wish I'd been we, there. We <laughs> sat and talked and talked and I, I explained the story to him and I said, you're the person that needs to be in Plattsburgh. How do we get you there? You know, let me send you this information. Take a look at it and if you don't believe what, what's there, you know, I'm not doing my job right. And he looked at all the information and said, you know, the site's been gone over twice. And I said, I understand that. They're not 1812 archaeologists. They're not approaching it the right way. You have a unique set of skills. And I have all of the documentation, thanks to all those who came before me. And with Alan Everest and, and uh, Lee Harris, you know, they were probably two of the, of the most prolific as far as what they were what they were turning out, but they turned it out in secret because they couldn't prove anything. And finally, the body of evidence is so large that it can't be any other place. And in, at the bottom, the bottom overriding issue is it never moved, it never went anywhere. People just forgot where it was. And if you read the documents, and as Alan Everest said, let the documents speak for themselves, you can't lose. You know, that's a part of the story that that our viewers, if they're regular viewers, know because you and I have talked about it on camera before. 
But for the sake of uh, wrapping it up properly on this program, it's something that got your attention how, how long ago for the first time? Well, this was 1993, no, 1991, when the Historical Association was, uh, was leaving City Hall. Uh, prior to that, uh, in the 80s, my sister gave me uh, a book, which I, which I recommend to everybody who comes to the Plattsburgh area that doesn't know anything about Plattsburgh. It's, it's Peter Palmer's History of Lake Champlain. Oh, it's a wonderful book. It sure is. It's, I consider it to be the primer for this area. It's easy reading. It's nice to read. It, it's historically accurate for the most part. There are some criticisms with it, but it's a wonderful thing. And you read that, and then you store it away. But they made the mistake of, of allowing me to throw out their trash when the Historical Association left. And, and they left uh, piles of what they considered to be useless old North Country notes. You know, And they, they made their distribution. They had a couple hundred left. They left it in a box. Well, they had to downsize and move to this Fitzpatrick home on Oak Street. So they left all the boxes. And I went, before I threw them out, I went and grabbed one of every one of those. And then I read them over the winter. And then I suddenly became aware in the spring, while I was reading one particular piece, that I had seen this term before, Pike's Cantonment. And there was two articles done by two different people. And then there was this Peter Palmer thing. Well, Pike's Cantonment was in three different places. How can that be? It's physically impossible. So which one's right? Or are they all wrong? That's where the journey started. And it piqued my interest. And, um, you know, it, you start talking and you start getting opinions. I don't want opinions. I want facts. And that drove me further. And as you know, many late nights and marching around the, the breakfast table, as they used to say on Wiry Radio, uh, I marched around the breakfast table with my little pieces of paper and my chicken scratched maps and tried to make sense out of them all. Well, the theme simmered and simmered and simmered and simmered. And, you know, I feel very privileged not only to call you my friend, but to be almost a confidant when it comes to the study of Pike's Cantonment from the very beginning. You uh, tried out all these uh, what other people call cockamamie schemes on your friend Gordy Little, and I was pleased and excited and titillated. And, you know, it was a, a hole worth digging, wasn't what it? What a ride. Wasn't what it great? Ride. Absolutely. It was, it was wonderful fun. And then uh, I think one of, the, one of the, the, the most wonderful things about it was I, get, I, I got to meet Alan Everest after you oh remember boy. the whole story. Oh, boy. Uh, I got to meet him after uh, months of pursuing him. Uh, and, and obviously I never took a class with him. But since then I've met many who have. Uh, and he, he ca cautiously guarded his research because he didn't want it to get out. And even he, in the process, um, he started in a location where he thought it might be. And we even got to the point where someone who, who was an undergraduate student wrote back to Plattsburgh and said, no, no, it can't be where you say it is because I was in class with Dr. Everest and we were down by the main mill. And he declared that it was here. Well, I submit that possibly he said it may be here. And if he did say it must be here, he at least changed his mind later when he got more information. So the answer is go to the primary documents. And some of them were not possibly available to him. Now we have more research tools available, but the caution remains the same. Go to the primary document and let the document speak for itself. Don't put your own things into it. Uh, and that's what we tried to do in this search. And by golly, if you say dig here, guess what you get? Uh, of course you don't know, unless you're, you're salting the mine with your own diamonds. Uh, <laughs> before that, you have no idea what's going to come dig up. No. You found some things in the past, yes. uh, some spikes, yes. and some other things, yes. and uh, you know, these, these uh, just confirmed what you were thinking, but to bring a doctor in, to bring a guy who's an anthropologist and an archaeologist in, uh, from over in the Watertown area, who's got vast experience, and who, how could he not feel your passion? And he, he told me that a few minutes ago, but he did, and to come over here and then start digging and find, you have no idea what you're going to come up with. I knew and people might look it. at, yeah, you know you're going to find something. Absolutely. But there are a couple of things that are that I've never seen before. Oh, 
it, truly. That, sure. that piece of that scabbard? Are you kidding me? That is a normal military implement. Never saw it. Certainly never saw it separated from the scabbard. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't have known what it was. A salt shaker. Well, that's why it's important to get someone who's experienced in the time period. Now, possibly the the others uh, that were there didn't know what they were looking for, and you can only hope that, that if they found something, they recorded everything they they saw, and you know, that may be the case. And again, as, as Dr. Abel said tonight, uh, your chances of finding something in a random search are not good, really. And that was the conventional thinking at the time. But now that the, the research methods are there, uh, you can start to find the artifacts that you're looking for. But more importantly, you have to know what you're looking for to begin with. How so, did the actual digging, uh, when did the digging take place? This, uh, the latest round. It started in uh, in August. Was it last week of August, July? What was the what were the dates? August, August, oh, August first. Yeah, yeah, through the fifth. That's correct. And uh, and we brought in uh, archaeological students. We had one teacher from from uh, the local area. Several people that are members of the association. They all paid to do this. I love it. And uh, that's the only way that we, as an organization who doesn't charge to get in our museum, uh, we, we support ourselves, And we support ourselves with donations and sales in our gift shop. So in order to get Dr. Abel here, we had to pay his expenses. The logical way to do that is to use the model that universities have, and that is self-funded archaeological work. Uh, for the experience, for the credit, uh, you pay the fee. Uh, and that supported Dr. Abel for the week here, so at least in the mind. So there will be more chapters. Absolutely. Next week, next year, four weeks, uh, we're going to run an archaeological field school here uh, in cooperation with uh, Clinton Community College. And in parallel with that, the North Country Teacher Resource Center is going to run an in-service credit opportunity for teachers in the area. And then there may be opportunities for others who are members of the association. They would still have to pay for, uh, for the opportunity. But uh, you know that the people that were there this year will never forget the experience that they came with, and they have bragging rights. They can say that I was on the initial team that that rediscovered the only intact. War of 1812 encampment site in the nation. I so the bragging rights are there. I love it. Now, as president of the Battle of Plattsburgh Association, uh, what's the status these days? We're, we're sitting here recording this on the evening of the 8th of September, on the eve almost of September 11th. Yes. So what's the status of this organization? We are, I'm happy to report that we are thoroughly solvent, which is wonderful. We have money in the bank, which is uh, a wonderful thing. Uh, we're expanding again, at least in a limited limited sense. We, we've started the preliminary things, and uh, obviously we have to get the permits and the rest of that in place. Uh, but we've outlined where we want to go with that, at least in context now. So we're looking to support the community and give them what they need at this point. And what they need is what they're finding and they're finding that history is a good thing. I love it. Keith Ergolo, thanks so, so much for your friendship, for all your hard work in history, and for once again finding Pike's Controlment.